with that, we'll go ahead while they're taking care of the other technical difficulties. And tonight we have our very own Joseph Connor talking about spooky spiders. And I know I printed out the whole blurb about you, but you can tell us more about your experiences. He's a uh, definitely an excellent photographer and does a lot of micro photography and does a lot of posting on iNaturalist. And some of his photos have been um, captured and noticed by experts. And so we're real tickled that he has such expertise. And he's going to show uh, what he's found out about some spooky spiders for us. No, well, thanks. Uh, my my little blurb was pretty short, so I guess it was pretty easy to misplace. <laughs> uh, I, my name is Joseph Connors. I'm a Texas Master Naturalist with the South Texas Border Chapter. Uh, my hobby is macro photography. Uh, I especially like to go out looking for bugs and spiders at night for one of the same reasons uh, night uh, they're nocturnal is because it's not hot at night. Um, spiders are what first got me into um, macro photography. They held still uh, most of the time, or at least some of the time. Uh, I'm not a spider expert, but uh, I've been taking spider photos for years. And once I got into iNaturalist, I've learned so much more. Uh, and so I, I just love learning about them. Uh, since Halloween's near, I'm going to cover some of the spookier sounding ones. There's a lot of people are afraid of spiders, uh, but one way to get over that is to become a macro photographer. Uh, a lot of my spider friends online uh, used to be scared of spiders. Uh, they uh, got, once you start looking at them up close, it's different. Uh, some of them have even become arachnologists. Uh, they're... Um, Spiders are important because they uh, reduce mosquitoes uh, and other pests, um, and they're an important source for uh, baby birds uh, for food. So 16 years ago, I started a, uh, a thing. Uh, it was a challenge between my friend on uh, a photo sharing site Flickr. Um, we had taken a lot of spider pictures, and I had more than I need, knew what to do with, and uh, so I said, I think I have enough. I could post one every day of the week or every day of the month. And she said, I think so too. So by the end of the month, that became Arachtober. Uh, and years later, that's spread to Twitter and Instagram and now Facebook uh, and who knows where else. Uh, those are the only ones I'm on. Uh, but we have people, uh, uh, spider scientists and regular people uh, participating around the world. I've uh, got several... Um, Arachnologist societies follow me on Twitter, and um, I only use Twitter one one month a year mostly. But uh, uh, it's really fun to interact with the scientists and show people what we spiders look like and teach them. So uh, even before I really got into citizen science, I've sort of been doing a little bit of that for a while. Uh, so if you've seen some of my presentations before, there's probably have been a lot of spiders. Uh, but I've added a whole bunch more. This is the first time I've done a whole hour on spiders. Uh, so there's some new stuff for you. So fall is when you start noticing spiders more often. Uh, you might notice uh, big webs or you might run into them. Uh, many species have reached maturity around this season and uh, it's mating time. So spiders are arachnids. Uh, they differ from insects because they have eight legs, usually eight eyes two body segments, the abdomen and the cephalothorax. Uh, all but one family of spiders are venomous, uh, but very few are dangerous to humans. Uh, insects have three body segments and six legs. Uh, there are many different families of spiders and different hunting techniques and are trying to figure out how to organize everything. Um, so my presentation is actually kind of disorganized uh, since there's a uh, I've documented 142 different species on iNaturalist from the valley, uh, and, and there's 73 more that I haven't seen yet that I know are around, uh, and I'm sure there's plenty more. Uh, so I'm going to cover some of the most common ones and some of the most interesting ones, and because of Halloween, the, some of the spooky ones. Uh, orb weavers are a large family of spiders uh, that are particularly noticeable because they're big circular webs. Uh, orb weaver spiders don't need uh, good eyesight because they wait for the prey to come to them. Uh, they feel vibrations when something hits their sticky web and then they quickly wrap it up and bite it. 
Uh, this is a tropical orb weaver, one of the easiest to find spiders in the valley. Uh, and they're also along the Gulf Coast. Uh, there's some in all the way to Florida. They uh, they start spinning their web after dark and take the take it down in the morning. Uh, and they'll spend the day under a leaf hiding from the sun and predators. Can you see the spider here? She looks just like the dead leaves. Right here, that's this white spot is her uh, back of her abdomen. Here's your eyes. Uh, juveniles of this species have a nice green spot on their back. Uh, as you can see, there are two eye spots. Uh, and though they may be there to confuse predators. Uh, eye spots become less prominent or disappear on the adult females. Uh, this shot shows another pattern that they can look like during as an adult female. Uh, as adults, the females can be about one inch. Uh, before I started really learning about spiders a lot, uh, I, probably for a few years, I thought ser this was several different species. I couldn't, I, I knew that some of them were tropical orb weavers, but the rest were s confusing. But the, the little green one was my favorite. It turns out that's a super common young tropical orb weaver. Uh, so, and here is what the male looks like. The males are a little bit smaller than the females, uh, probably about two thirds in this species. Uh, in most species, the males are significantly smaller. Uh, the uh, this one is also uh, hairier, and uh, the abdomen is much smaller. Uh, so some nocturnal orb weavers are sensitive to light, so if you shine your bright flashlight at them for too long, they they may take their web down. Uh, so we try to avoid that when we're out looking for spiders uh, because it takes a lot of energy to put into uh, building a web. And if they haven't caught anything, that's energy gone to waste. Uh, this is another common species of orb weaver, uh, the silver garden spider. Uh, these are uh, bigger, uh, up to three inch leg span. Uh, these are also active during the day and usually keep their webs in the same place for a long time. Uh, I frequently find these living among cactuses. This is a, uh, the zigzag pattern is called the stable mentium. Uh, there's many different theories on why spiders make it, uh, but since spiders don't speak English, we don't know for sure. Uh, originally, it was assumed that it was made to stabilize the web, which is where the name comes from. Uh, now it seems more likely to confuse predators by making the spiders look bigger or possibly to prevent uh, large animals from running into the web. There's been some uh, studies that uh, the stable mendium reflects UV light and some birds can see then UV, uh, so it may detect uh, birds from running into it. Uh, you may see in this species, the male is significantly smaller uh, yeah, up there in the corner. Uh, I usually tell people that if you find an orb weaver, chances are it's a female. Uh, males don't live as long. Uh, they are often smaller, and so they're much more easily overlooked. And uh, as an adult, the males don't normally make webs. Uh, they, they mostly just wander looking for mates. Uh, this is a silver garden spider uh, egg sac, and the, the little hatchlings just coming out. Uh, their egg sacs can be yellow or green, light green. Uh, and on the other side is a juvenile uh, showing much fancier stable mentium than the adult. Uh, the entire width of that uh, stable mentium is about the size of a dime. Uh, this is one of um, probably our third most common spider. This is also active during the day, uh, well, day and night. Uh, these are uh, come in a variety of colors, uh, either white, yellow, or orange. And the um, the colored part is actually the top of the abdomen of the spider. But these guys always hang upside down. So the the little this is her face right here, and the little eyes. Uh, and the valley has several species of ghost spiders. So now we're getting to the spooky ones. Uh, this is the genus Wolfilia. Uh, I think the most spooky looking of the ghost spiders, uh, nice and white. Uh, they're very small. Uh, they don't make webs. Their uh, long, thin legs uh, are helpful to identify them. Uh, 
they're maybe about half a centimeter. And I haven't seen too many of them. Uh, and the ones I have seen have not been very cooperative for photography. This is a, a, a bit bigger ghost spider, uh, the genus Habana. Uh, these are you may find in your garden at night on the flowers. Uh, I see these a whole lot more often. Uh, since we have ghosts, we need goblins too. Uh, this is a goblin spider. I don't think I'd ever heard of this one uh, family before posting to iNaturalist. Uh, they don't appear very common in Texas, but I found this one in my own backyard. Um, I kind of think I remember it being really small, uh, but I just don't even really remember shooting it. Uh, it was, uh, I was contacted by somebody that working on a scholastic kids book uh, about using this photo uh, which caused me to do a little extra research. I figured if somebody's going to use my photo in a book, uh, I want to make sure the ID is correct. So I uh, contacted an arachnologist I'm Facebook friends with, and uh, her first question was, does it have six eyes? Um, it's not real clear from the photos, but probably. Uh, later she looked at it more closely and suggested the genus Hertuopinus. Um Maybe I pronounced that right. Uh, and then she said, uh, the thing you're looking for is this is a swelling of the prolateral surface of the palpatella with a grouping of spines coming from it. I only stood, understood about half of those words, uh, but with the photo she sent, I managed to understand uh, she meant that it had, uh, this genus has spines facing inwards from the palps. Uh, she said that this species may be parthogenetic, parthogenic, uh, parthenogenic. Uh, well, they reproduce without males, maybe. Uh, so have you ever decide, tried trouble deciding what to dress for for Halloween? Maybe you wanted to be a, spy, a spider or a pirate? Why not both? Pirate spiders don't get their name from wearing eye patches or peg legs. It's because they steal food from other pi, uh, spiders. Uh, but more frequently, they attack and eat the other spiders. Uh, they'll pluck the strands of the victim's web to imitate prey, and uh, and when the the uh, victim comes close, they bite it on the leg, and um, they'll take over the web for a while. And uh, uh, these are pretty small spiders, about half a centimeter long. Uh, the family is usually yellowish and brown, and can be uh, recognized by this row of spine-like hairs on their front legs. Uh, you will often find these hanging down from a tree like the uh, this guy in that pose. Uh, or uh, you could also, maybe you want to wear a sequin dress to the Halloween party, so you could go as a dewdrop spider. Uh, these are very small, uh, but they're so shiny. If you know where to look and, and there happens to be one there, uh, there's a good chance you'll find them. They're cobweb weavers, and they can build their own webs, but Often they live at the edge of larger spiders webs. Uh, so these are, uh, these spiders are kleptoparasites, meaning they take food from the larger spiders web. Uh, so I often spot them alongside the silver argeo garden spiders. Uh, they can be hard to fly, uh, hard to shoot with a flash because they're so shiny, but uh, because of that shininess, uh, it, with a flashlight or something, if you search in the edge of the web, you might be able to spot one. And do you like butterflies? Now we have a butterfly spider or butterfly orb weaver. Uh, this small spider, Arenus pegnia, gets its common name, butterfly orb weaver, from the pattern on its abdomen. Uh, the butterfly can be either yellow or pink. Uh, the spider weaves both a small orb web and a tangle web. It uh, hides its, in its web retreat and uses a strand of web attached to the hub of the orb to feel when something gets caught in the web. Uh, it's widely distributed, uh, especially in the eastern United States. Uh, this is the southern house spider, also known as a southern crevice spider. Uh, I really like finding these. They, to me, they're really good Halloween spooky spiders. Uh, they're kind of big and a little creepy looking. Uh, but they're not dangerous. Uh, it could be up to two inches long. Uh, I often find these in my uh, grandpa's garage out in Louisiana at the uh, at parks around here. I often find them on mesquite trees. If you find this 
pattern like this uh, around a little hole. That's probably where she lives. Um, the females don't leave, don't go far from their crevice, uh, and the males are always out on the run looking for the females, so they don't make a web. Uh, the webs of these spiders are not sticky. It's more like Velcro to uh, slow down and ensnare the insect legs, and then the spider runs out quickly and grabs them. Uh, this is another spider that doesn't build a web. This is a spitting spider. Uh, this is a six-eyed genus. Uh, they get their name from how they catch their prey. Uh, they spit a sticky venomous fluid that immobilizes the victim. And their eyesight isn't very good, so they'll get close and tap their legs around their prey to get it just in the right spot and uh, spit at it. Uh, since they're slow-moving spiders, they'll often They'll also use their spit defensively and can spit over 10 times their body length, so still only a few inches. Um, and the, the pattern of their face just looks like a human skull to me, so that makes them a good Halloween spider. So when I go out shooting for butterflies, uh, this is the kind of shot that gets me most excited. Uh, I entered this into the Butterfly Festival photo contest this year. Uh, I called it, titled it Busy Flower. Uh, it probably isn't going to make first place and get on the wall, but um, I'm hoping for a finalist. Uh, each year I try and sneak a spider in. So uh, first we have a southern skipperling, and we have an ambush bug. Uh, you can see there's the head of the ambush bug right in the neck of the butterfly. And uh, then we have a crab spider female, uh, genus Mechafiza. Uh, that's one of the really common uh, genuses around here and um, one of the ones that is identifiable. Uh, crab spiders are difficult to identify, even for the experts. Um, and so next we have, there's a male crab spider hiding underneath. Here's his two legs. I didn't even see him when I was out shooting. I noticed him on my pictures. And since I'm labeling everything, uh, this is a skeleton leaf golden eye. Uh, I didn't stick around to see what, uh, how things turned out, uh, but I would guess the uh, ambush uh, bug was the winner here. Uh, the spider was probably waiting for the butterfly to get close and just kept waiting because it ain't going to move anywhere. Uh, so crab spiders are in the family Thomasidae, uh, and this, uh, this genus I said was one of the most common in the RGV. Uh, and crab spiders are also ambush hunters, just like the ambush bug. Uh, this is a relative. Uh, this is a running crab spider. Uh, Wikipedia says these are uh, distinctively flattened. Uh, I find these guys often stretched out across leaves waiting for prey, or maybe they're posing for photos. Uh, the family tends to have a longer second pair of legs than the Thomasid crab spiders in the previous photo. Uh, they're in the same superfamily as crab spiders, but not as closely related as previously thought. Um, every year I'm learning new things by participating in Arctober. Uh, I just learned that uh, this family tends to lose their legs easier. So uh, Bug Eric says he uses that as a hint when identifying spiders he doesn't recognize. Uh, this is a green link spider, uh, pretty common. You can find these during the day, uh, some at night too. Um, they like to wait around flowers. Uh, this was on a prickly pear. Um, this, uh, this one caught, I've caught, I shot her at night. She caught a, uh, horsefly. Um, a few years ago, I pointed out one of these to a, uh, somebody who turned out to be a, uh, spider fan too. Uh, she told me that lynxes spit. I had never heard that before. So when I got home, I Googled it and she was right. So I, it was, uh, some 1984 article. Uh, said that they can spit up to 20 centimeters, about eight inches, uh, to defend themselves from predators. Uh, and it uh, can cause a couple of days of eye irritation, but doesn't seem dangerous to humans. Uh, the spitting was discovered because the scientist that was studying them, uh, I guess she kept getting looking up real close to them, and she'd find little spots on her glasses. So these are sylvan jumping spiders. Um, not super common, but they're around, uh, the male and female. Uh, 
these are um, what made these uh, finally get into my presentation was uh, I finally got my first spider bite last year on July 4th. It was a little female of these. Uh, yeah, I was on my way home from the butterfly center and apparently a hitchhiker got in my shirt. So uh, it, the fabric moving around when I was putting the seat belt on, uh, she must have felt threatened or squished and she bit me right under my shirt collar. Uh, I thought it was a mosquito, so I swatted it. Um, she didn't make it, uh, but I was able to recognize uh, what species it probably was. And um, it definitely felt different than a mosquito bite. The itch was different, um, but it, it wasn't painful. Uh, and Seth, who's been bit a few times by spiders, has said uh, it's a different type of itch. But uh, at least with these, they're not bad. Uh, and this is a cobweb spider uh, built. Uh, they build di a different type of web than orb weavers. It, they're also called scatter webs or tangle webs. Um, the most well known of these is the black widow. Uh, here we have a black, female black widow with her traditional hourglass pattern. Uh, widows are usually found in darker sheltered places. Uh, widows and all spiders normally only bite in uh, humans in self-defense. Uh, this is a male we noticed crawling on someone's arm at a night hike. Uh, I didn't recognize it at the time. I got good photos of it and then realized maybe we should get that off uh, just in case. I kind of had a suspicion. And uh, But uh, males probably aren't as bad. Uh, they don't have as much venom. Uh, and uh, there's been no deaths from a uh, confirmed bite of a black widow since 1983. Um, so if you are bit, it's a good idea to seek medical attention, but uh, they're not as dangerous as people think they are. Uh, we have two species of black widow in the valley, the southern black widow and the western black widow. Uh, they usually cannot be distinguished from photos. Uh, I've never been able to find an expert that can. Uh, I wish I could get mine to species because everybody likes to have their uh, stuff identified. Um, and I told uh, by somebody with more experience at Black Widows, if you ever stick your hand in a dark place and you feel a really strong web that resists pushing, pull your hand out. Uh, these guys make really stiff webs and I've I've experienced that with one I caught uh, cleaning out her jar and it was it was like that, a very stiff web. Uh, so we also have a Brown Widow here. Uh, I've read that they're not considered as dangerous. They're probably less likely to bite and they inject less venom. Uh, they're not native to our area. They're, uh, they were first described in South America, but it's now believed that they are from South Africa. Uh, recluses are the other type of spiders that's considered medically significant to humans. Uh, this is, uh, they're also known as a violin spider for the pattern uh, on that they sometimes have on their cephalothorax. Uh, this is a Texas recluse. This is the first one I ever saw. It was uh, caught for a show and tell part of a night hike at McAllen Nature Center a few years ago. Uh, they seem to like living under rotting logs. Uh, they're much smaller than I expected. You can see next to that screw head. Um, they're, the body is just a couple of centimeters. And you probably aren't going to get close enough to uh, count, but these guys only have six eyes. And just in case you missed it, uh, this is where the violin is. So scientists say we don't get the uh, brown recluse in Texas. Uh, we So this is uh, based on range. We know that if we find a recluse, it's this uh, Texas recluse. Um, without DNA in a microscope, uh, we you can't tell the difference. But uh, supposedly, uh, all the ones here should be Texas recluse. So uh, I sometimes get asked if the Texas recluse venom is any less dangerous or more dangerous to humans uh, than the brown recluse. And of course, I had that same question too. So I checked with a spider scientist on Twitter who uh, runs a page called Recluse or Not. Uh, so if you think you've got a recluse, they'll answer yes or no. Uh, she said, as far as they know, uh, pretty much the same. Uh, very few, if any, verified bites from other recluse species to compare with. Um, and I found a, a book on recluses that says pretty much the same thing. 
So wolf spiders are uh, have a kind of similar look, but they're more hairy uh, and more pa uh, pattern to them. Uh, they have good eyesight, lar big large eyes, uh, the forward uh, large pair of forward facing eyes. Uh, it's helpful for identifying them. <clears throat> As with all spiders, they can produce silk, but they don't make a web. Uh, female wolf spiders carry their egg sac beneath the abdomen, and uh, that's what this one's doing. And then when the babies hatch, they'll continue to ride on top of her for a while, which is what the other one's doing. Uh, they're not aggressive and they're not considered dangerous to humans, but I've heard if they do bite, it can be painful. Uh, maybe like a bee sting or a little worse. Um, an often repeated fun fact, uh, wolf spiders hunt and eat brown recluse spiders. Um, they can do that. Uh, but they'll eat pretty much whatever they can catch, uh, like uh, spiders, wolf, uh, cockroaches, crickets, silverfish. So uh, wolf spiders are some of the easiest to find uh, spiders, uh, and some kids really get into it, uh, the, counting all the wolf spiders they can find. The reason it's so easy is it's called uh, spider sniffing. It reflects eye shine with your flashlight, uh, you hold the flashlight up beside your eyes or in front of your nose, um, and uh, the little sparkle in the grass there, uh, it's not as blue as it is in the, in the video, but you'll see that uh, in the grass. And sometimes there's a whole lot of them. Uh, sometimes the sparkles are due, uh, but a uh, good chance you'll find some wolf spiders that way. Uh, I, whenever I'm out, I just have a hard time not looking for wolf spiders. I don't take pictures of all of them, but uh, it's just interesting to see how many are out there. Uh, and so this is an example of tapetum lucidium. Uh, it's a reflective layer of cells at the back of the eye to capture more light and see better in the dark. Uh, many other animals have this reflective uh, thing at the back of their eyes, <coughs> like uh, cats, dogs, and alligators. This is another similar uh, body shape. Uh, it's a funnel weaver. Uh, these are nocturnal spiders that uh, uh, they uh, they don't wander like a wolf spider. They uh, live in a funnel-shaped web. Uh, I've seen them build their webs on brush piles or between cactuses. Uh, their webs are not sticky, but they're full of Velcro-like entangling filaments, uh, and they react quickly to vibration and uh, grab whatever's landed on it, <coughs> similar to the uh, crevice spiders. Now this one, I don't have a whole lot that I know about these, uh, but it's such a nice shot I had to share it. Uh, when I first saw these, I was sure it was a fishing spider. Uh, they're in the same family, nursery web spiders, but uh, this is Tinnus peregrinus. Uh, it's a, they're smaller than the fishing spiders. Uh, this one was taken from the boardwalk at Edinburgh uh, Scenic Wetlands. Um, Benson State Park's another place I see a lot of them on the uh, the walls. Uh, especially around the uh, the lights that attract the moths. Um, so I just love this because of the water tension under her legs. And this is the Texas tan tarantula. It's native to our uh, the southern Texas and northern Mexico. Uh, this species is one of the largest tarantulas in the United States, with uh, females commonly reaching a leg span of six inches. Tarantulas don't build a, uh, a typical web, but they do line their burrows with silk. Uh, they make their burrows in usually in dead trees or empty rodent burrows, uh, stacks of wood or natural crevices. If you live out in the country, you may find these in your yard. Uh, at Benson State Park, they're uh, uh, pretty good, easy to spot. Uh, you can't use um, spider sniffing to find these, but uh, they're big and if they're moving around, uh, they're pretty easy to spot. Uh, and I forgot to mention that was the only species you're likely to find in the valley, the Texas tan tarantula. This species uh, I've not seen in the wild. This one was taken at uh, a spider show at Quinta Mazatlan a few years ago. Uh, this is the Rio Grande gold tarantula. Uh, this one is seen over toward Falcon State Park uh, along the river. Uh, I really, really want to go see one, but I don't make it out that very often. 
these guys are, are popular in the pet trade too because they're just so pretty. So back to small spiders. Uh, this is an ant mimic spider. Uh, this species is usually, uh, this this species I, well, those species I usually find don't look as much like an ant as this one, uh, but there's a lot of, uh, of different, uh, totally different families that mimic spider uh, ants. Uh, this one was about four millimeters. Uh, it was running down the inside of my front door and uh, it just didn't walk just like an ant. So I got up and looked closer and uh, I, I've been able to identify her down to genus, thanks to iNaturalist. Um, a lot of these little spiders are difficult. Um, so ant mimics often live near ants' nests and they feed on small insects, including the ants. Uh, ant mimicry is a very sick, effective for so many spiders have evolved to do it. Uh, many ant species or ant mimic species have uh, evolved to smell like ants uh, so they can walk around and avoid detection. Uh, and some wave their front antennas around. I mean, they wave their front legs around to look like antennas uh, so they look like an ant. Uh, so looking and moving like an ant, and that also protects them from predators because uh, most predators don't want to eat ants because the formic acid uh, doesn't taste good. Uh, this is another ant mimic spider, uh, not a common one. I've only seen this one once. Uh, this was spotted by a young uh, frequent night hike visitor. Uh, it turned out to be a species of ant mimic that uh, that had not been uh, seen in the valley. Uh, there was no records of it being in South Texas, uh, assuming we've got the ID right. Uh, sent it to, uh, well, sent the photos to some experts. And uh, of course, you can't ever really tell unless you have the specimen, but uh, it, uh, I really like finding that one. This is uh, one of my favorite spiders. Uh, this is a bolus spider, southern bolus spider. Uh, she's in a genus that extremely well camouflaged like bird droppings. Uh, not many things want to eat bird poop. Uh, this is not a commonly found spider, but uh, I'm, I've seen a surprising number of them in the last few years. I used to think they weren't even in our area at all. Um, so the, they don't make a traditional web, but she is an orb weaver. Uh, instead, she dangles uh, a line of uh, web with an extra sticky blob on the end, uh, which she uses like a bolo. Um, and she emits moth-like pheromones to attract the male moths to get them in range. Now, I've never managed to catch her or see her catching anything, uh, but I've been out looking. Uh, I tried setting up lights and getting on video, but uh, she didn't like the lights, so she quit hunting. So uh, this is, uh, she's about 12 millimeters, just smaller than a penny. This is where she sleeps during the day. She uh, comes out and goes back and hunts on the same, I mean, goes back to sleep on that same leaf. Uh, we watched her for a few months. Uh, this is one of her egg sacs. Uh, also looks like bird poop. Uh, they, they really love the bird poop theme and it works. And this is another strange spider. Uh, uh, not too common, but... Uh, Every time I see one, I get excited. Um, this is a uh, pale frilled orb weaver, uh, Caria alba. Uh, I, I visited this spider for several months uh, trying to finally get this shot. Uh, it was at, uh, at the McAllen Nature Center. So I'd go on the night hikes and uh, try and uh, get to see her putting up her web. Uh, I, I figured she was an orb weaver. She must make a web but uh, she doesn't. She does similar to the bolus spider. Uh, she uses pheromones to attract moths, uh, but instead of making a, uh, a sticky blob of web, she just reaches out and grabs them. Uh, so the body of these, uh, the adult females, is about half a centimeter long, and most of the ones I've seen are whitish, uh, kind of creamy white. Uh, and then here we have an ogre face spider. Uh, this spider was, uh, I really wanted to go see this species, uh, and, uh, 
ogres are really good for sharing for spooky uh, spiders because uh, ogres are spooky. So these these photos I borrowed from Ranger Raul Garza. Uh, he got these when he was at um, Resaca de la Palma. Uh, these spiders are in the net casting family. Uh, they create a, a net of web and stretch it in front of their legs. And when prey is near, they lurch forward and, and catch it in their net. Uh, they have really good eyesight at night, uh, thanks to the two big eyes. Uh, they have, uh, well, they have more eyes, but two of them are really big. Uh, and the, because of that, their faces are really cute if you like spiders. Um, I've always thought this family was really interesting, but I never thought I'd be able to see one this close to home. Uh, this species was first discovered uh, to be in the United States a few years ago uh, at, at Resaca de la Palma. Uh, they're normally found in central Mexico. Uh, so uh, now we may have two species in Texas, uh, assuming this is a full population instead of just some strays. Um, the, uh, the other one starts around Houston area and stretches along to for uh, Florida. And speaking of Florida, I'm in Florida right now. And just last week, I saw my first three ogres it's not the species we have in the valley, but uh, I'm making an excuse to share them here because you can see them somewhere in Texas. And this shows her net. There's that little bluish uh, web here she's holding in front of her. And you know, tiny view, side view of her eyes. Next time I got to try harder to get the eyes. But this was up in a tree and I had to borrow a ladder. Uh, luckily, my friend had it in his truck uh, on his way home from work. So uh, squeezing your camera in between branches, standing on a ladder, uh, I was happy to get whatever I could get. So this is a uh, another one I posted recently on uh, Facebook and Twitter and everywhere. Uh, I had no idea what this one was, but it's red and kind of cute. So uh, I several people pointed out that it uh, the eyes look kind of wolf spider like. So. Uh, Sarah Rose, the author of a brand new spider field guide, which I really like, uh, thought it looked like a geolycosa uh, and check with her other friend who confirmed it is a young geocyclosa, uh, which is a burrowing wolf spider. Uh, this is one of the few adult pictures I've got of them. Uh, I rarely see uh, these, but uh, after researching them a little this week, I've realized I may see their holes sometimes. They're just, uh, they just run and hide real quick so I don't get a shot of them. Uh, this one, the adult here seem to be uh, hunting ants. Um, and as you can see, the eye pattern on both of these is pretty similar. And so if you wanna learn how to identify spiders, looking at their eyes is a really good way to identify them. Uh, some spiders are pretty easy uh, and some take a little bit of practice. Uh, if I hadn't forgot to look at the eyes, it would have been pretty obvious to me there, at least I could have narrowed it down to a wolf spider. Uh, so here you can compare, this is the eyes of that adult. Uh, you can, uh, you have to kind of adjust your imagination a little to uh, line up the with the, the drawings, but uh, there's the two uh, uh, Lycosidae, which is the wolf spiders. So uh, that would have narrowed it down. And, uh, and then over in the corner is the face of the ogre spider, which is why I really got to see a picture front view of that because they're just so cute. Uh, and then next we have, this is not a spider, but Arachtober celebrates all arachnids. Uh, harvestmen are a type of arachnids uh, in the order Opilionas. They're frequently mistaken for spiders. Uh, these are often called daddy long legs, but that's not a good common name since it's used for three different families of arthropods. There's also spider uh, daddy long legs, crane fly daddy long legs, and harvestman daddy long legs. So uh, in the harvestman, uh, the thorax and abdomen are fused. Uh, so they do have the two body parts of a uh, an arachnid, but they're fused. Um, and they only have two eyes, unlike most spiders that have eight. And they have no venom glands, meaning they're not dangerous to humans. And they don't have any silk glands, so they don't produce webs. 
Here's a close-up of the harvestmen. Uh, they start foraging at twilight, and they're both predators and scavengers. Uh, they eat you know, plants, insects, fungi, uh, whatever they can get. And for a quick comparison, uh, this is a cellar spider. Uh, well, this is uh, also known as the daddy long leg spider. Uh, unlike the harvestmen, these hang upside down from their messy webs uh, and often found in the corners of your garage. Uh, there's an urban legend that uh, daddy long leg spiders uh, have the most potent venom of any spider. Uh, but that the fangs are too short or too small or too weak to puncture human skin. Uh, Mythbusters did an experiment uh, on an episode in 2004 uh, that showed the bite does penetrate skin, but it only produces a mild, short-lived burning sensation. And back to the other arachnids. Uh, these are really popular finds on night hikes. Uh, the striped bark scorpion is the species you're most likely to find. Uh, there's several others possible, but I've never seen any. Uh, scorpions glow under the black light, uh, which makes them easy to spot with a UV flashlight. Uh, they're not dangerous to humans uh, unless you have an allergic reaction, at least this species. Um, I've been told it feels like a bee sting. Um, John at Astero has a lot of experience with them. Uh, they, he has become allergic to them now. He's gotten enough stings, so you do have to be careful. Um, and you should see plenty of these on a night hike at either Benson or Astero. Um, and a recent theory as to why they glow is that their skin detects and they can feel the UV coming from the sun. So they know when they're not hidden. So because of that, you'll hardly ever see these during the day. And these are another arachnid with, uh, they have many names. Uh, they're Camel spiders or wind scorpions or sun spiders. Uh, most North American species are nocturnal. Uh, they look like a cross between a spider and a scorpion, but they're neither. They're in their own order of solifuge. Uh, they don't have venom. Uh, and I recently found that sometimes they glow under UV light. Uh, not nearly as much or as bright as a scorpion, but uh, that was an interesting find. And I don't know what it means. They don't always glow, so maybe it's different species, or different ages, who knows, but it's interesting. Um, and if you're looking real careful, it looks like this guy's got 10 legs. Uh, that's because his front pair are actually uh, pedipalps. Uh, on spiders, the pedipalps are much smaller and can easily be told apart from legs, but uh, here they're quite large and they, they use them like antennas uh, as well as for feeding. Uh, in scorpions, the uh, larger pincers are their modified pedipalps. So here's some of my spider reading recommendations. Uh, the top one, that's the uh, the little pamphlet at, at the HEB checkout. Uh, it's pretty good for starting off uh, learning about some common spiders. Uh, it leaves out a lot, but you can, it's a good starting place. Uh, the second one is a little bitty book. Um, it, it's it seemed like to me uh, like a kid's book, but just because of the size, I never looked in it. Uh, but then I realized who wrote it. Uh, Levi is a uh, an arachnologist with uh, 150 scientific papers, uh, and he described a lot of the species I've talked about tonight. Uh, so uh, it turned out it was a much more um, educational book than I thought it was. Not just for kids, but readable by kids too. Uh, next is a is a popular one, uh, The Common Spiders of North America by Bradley. Uh, it also doesn't have a lot of our common species, but the, something in the family, you can look up a relative. Uh, it's a good book. And then the re most recent one came out just a few months ago, uh, Spiders of North America by Sarah Rose. Uh, I mentioned her earlier. Uh, this was the field guide that I've been waiting for. I would hope for a Texas or Valley only uh, book, but maybe I'll have to write that someday. Probably not. Uh, I pre-ordered this one because it was so, it looked so good when it arrived. It was 600 pages. Uh, that's just amazing. So I'm very happy with this book. Uh, it doesn't include everything, but it includes a lot. And so if you're interested in spiders, uh, you can follow along with us on the hashtag Arachtober on lots of different uh, uh, platforms, Facebook, Instagram,
Twitter and uh, Flickr and who knows what else. Uh, and so I just want to mention we're um, Texas Master Naturalists and we're a volunteer organization providing education and outreach services and support for beneficial management of natural resources and nature areas. Uh, our training classes cover a wide variety of topics on nature and natural resources uh, management. Uh, there's not a whole lot about spiders, but uh, each of our members brings our own interests and knowledge. Uh, at one of our meetings, they asked me if I could do a presentation on the creatures of the night. I hadn't done a presentation since school and I never liked doing them, but it turns out if it's the right topic, uh, I'm good at it and I like it. Uh, so this was very fun. I always like talking about spiders uh, and our registration for our classes is open now. Classes are from January to March and check out our new class page on our website. Uh, anybody got questions? I have one. Okay. Um, I know you said that when you, if you put out regular flashlights and things that it kind of spook some of the spiders, mm -hmm. they'll take down their webs. Have you ever tried or heard anything about using red light? Like we do it as when we're doing astronomy things, where it doesn't affect the human's eyes like it does the. I don't know uh, for sure if it light. makes a difference, but I did try that on that bolus spider I was trying oh. to do video over, and that's the one time I did get a decent, well, almost decent video over, uh, mm -hmm. was with red light. Uh, so it's, it seems like a ch chance that that works. I was just curious about that. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thanks. I very much enjoyed it too, and I do have a question. You talked about types of webs, and I made a note about cobwebs, and then I do know that you referred to net casting, and then the cobwebs looked different. They look totally messy, and I'm used to seeing the nice symmetrical webs. Mm -hmm. What are those called? The, the the big symmetrical circular ones, those are the orb webs, orb or orb, webs. And, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people confuse, if you just think, any old web is a cobweb or like an abandoned web. Cobwebs kind of become a, a general term of a thing that collects in the corner of your house or garage. And uh, but cobwebs are actually the 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 um, tangle webs or uh, like the black widows make the um, what else was that called? Yeah, cobweb. Yeah, cobweb spiders. So tangle web mm -hmm. and uh, mesh. I think not not mesh. I forget what the other term is. But there's a whole bunch of different techniques, and some of them do combinations, like that. Uh, that butterfly spider makes a little bit of each. And is there a special term for the tarantulas and others that have the webs at the opening or as a lining in in their ground nests? There could be. I don't know too much about tarantulas. Uh, they just uh, it, it until I started going out to. Uh, to Seth's place in the, the parks uh, a few years ago, I didn't, I, obviously I didn't have tarantulas in my backyard to learn about. So. Uh, I'll have just, to make some observations. I, I've, everywhere I've lived, I've had tarantulas. Every home I've ever lived in, we've had tarantulas, wow. even here in the valley. So, um, yeah, I know I have one in our backyard, <laughs> let the dogs eat in it. But, okay. Were there any other questions? I see lots of uh kudos and thanks and awesome and great presentation and as we are always thankful to have you here uh, as a member you do a great job like i say you got over any shyness or anything definitely and we appreciate yeah. it so much uh, if i'm talking about spiders i'm not shy <laughs> well thank you so much appreciate it all right so that was right about an hour for our presentation and program, which would be advanced training. And since there were some difficulties getting this on the Facebook site, if members uh, wind up needing to view it tomorrow, we'll go ahead and let you enter that for advanced training, even if you have to do the recording. Because um, we have Joseph available, so you can always ask him questions um, yeah. or go on one of the upcoming night walks uh, that he He's always anxious yeah. to join that I, walk. So. I forgot, uh, I should have mentioned uh, 
this Friday, I'm doing a spider presentation, which will be a, a shorter version of what you saw tonight and the spider walk at Benson State Park. And Saturday, right, is at the spooky science festival at uh, at Acero, and I'll be there with a spider table. All right. So there's your chances to follow up with questions. All right. Well, thank you so much. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started on the business meeting. Those of you who can, we appreciate you staying. We do have some announcements you want to hear about. Um, uh, the treasurer's report was attached, and I don't think there's anything unusual or outstanding to mention about the treasurer's report. Uh, it's there for review. If you notice something and have questions, uh, Gail is here tonight. Um, and you can always email her or check with her if there's something specific or ask any of us. We'll be glad to respond to that. Uh, minutes of the last meeting also are attached for review. So if you haven't gotten around to seeing those ahead of time, you can look at them afterwards. If you notice anything like misspelled names or something that might need correcting, um, just shoot us a, a, a little message so we can correct that. And otherwise, we will accept them as presented. And the treasurer's report will be filed for audit. Um, membership committee, Ronnie was not going to make it tonight. And um, Jennifer, were you able to get my uh, forwarded message? Yes. All I right. have it. If you give me one second, I will. Maybe get it up on the screen. <laughs> now, see, and I was chicken to try it, afraid I'd mess it up and wouldn't be here for the rest of the meeting. And Joseph talked enough already tonight. He didn't want to have to conduct a meeting, too. Yep, he called me this afternoon to let him know that he would not be here. Um, he is giving the membership director's report. And there's a, the next slide that um, these are the September, this is the September data that we're presenting. Um, there's 116 hours uh, entry eligible members. We have 96 active members, two of them are new. Uh, 20 are in training from both the 21 and 22 classes. We had 32 unique members logged service and AT hours through 20 service opportunities. We're doing a, little, a big variety of stuff, it looks like. There are 29 members logged volunteer hours and 23 members logged AT hours. And I'm hoping those of you that are listening tonight are some of those people. We had um, 297.25 service hours worth $8,483 of impact for our state. 37 total approved advanced training hours. The uh, monthly impact data uh, shows that 297.25 approved service hours, and the impact is on 177 adults and 16 youths. Um, total entries of volunteer service is 113, and advanced training total entries is 34. So that's um, uh, Ronnie's report. We appreciate him submitting that to us. He has been traveling. I know last week or whenever I talked to him, and he was in Maine, and he's just on the road uh, local tonight, but um, uh, still on the road. And he has to, called in before from his uh, car, so we appreciate all his efforts to get us information and share that. And I know Ann and... Um, Jim, Jerry are here tonight. Um, do you want to say anything about the class? Uh, I'll let Jim talk tonight. Okay. We'll just a few things. We're still uh, waiting on some confirmation of some class presenters. Um, so hopefully we can wrap that up at our meeting uh, Friday, right? Don't we have a meeting on the 20th? Yeah. Thursday. Ed Educational committee. Thursday? Whatever the 20th is. I, right here. Look, yeah. Right here, Thursday. All right. Thursday. I stand corrected. Um, Joseph, do you have a, any view on registration for the classes? Do we know if anyone's registered yet? You're on mute. Yeah, I don't get any of that directly. I uh, think that 
Ronnie uh, said there were several that had registered, and he was going to be getting that report, and it would he'd have that for you at the Thursday meeting. Okay. The there were six people from Keep McAllen Beautiful. We're wondering if they'd registered, um, but we'll talk Thursday about that. Other than that, uh, you know, things I think are going along all right. Um, Anne's keeping me in line, and we're doing okay. All right, and there is going to be an outreach opportunity at the fall festival on um, uh, October 22nd, and um, some of our members will be there, and there's going to be some flyers there um, to hand out. So that will uh, stimulate some more interest. And I I don't know about um, Anita whether or not there's any more uh, any more newspapers and stuff that are still have news releases to send out about the class. I know there's been a couple anyway. I uh, I tagged onto uh, the McAllen uh, third third Saturday story native story. I tagged onto it a uh, a box or a, uh, a sidebar mm -hmm. uh, about about um, uh, about a couple of things, and I ended it with another uh, mention of registering the the registration period for the class but um angel always sends me a pdf of uh the newspaper the the printed newspaper uh and and it's usually great but this time apparently she only used one one photo and i don't think the boxed story or the the sidebar was included i haven't asked her because it's certainly up to her as editor what she she prints and has room for, but so I think we lost that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I, I have not seen the late latest thing I saw where it was advertised was in the welcome home RGV uh, electronic news newsletter that goes out, I think once a week, uh, beginning in October through March. Okay. Uh, it goes to the to anybody who wants to have it, but the printed copies go to um, a number of of uh, parks in the in the valley, right. mostly in Mission and in um, Westlaco and Harlingen or McAllen area. Oh, lots watch and lots for that. Of, yeah, um, I'm not sure where they land when they're delivered, but I imagine it's at at the community centers at, at each of the parks. And it's mainly the bigger parks, but hundreds of them, hundreds of the parks get them delivered in the print printed version. Okay, very good. So the word is still getting out. And so um, uh, I think maybe if we could post the flyer on Facebook, then can people, can members share that flyer? Yeah, if we post it to our, uh, our public page and we yeah. normally do, I just, um, didn't think of it yet, I guess. I just thought of it myself and you've had program being lined up. So, yeah, so we can do that. So if you're on Facebook and uh, see our poster out there or the flyer about the um, class coming up, please share that with other people that are friends with you on Facebook. All right. So awards and recognition. River, I know you're here. Yes, I'm here. Oh, I can't get my video to go. There it goes. Uh, no, anyway, you don't need to see me anyway. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, um, two initial certifications. We have Elizabeth Eddy and Jim Geary, who have initially certified. They did it at the end of last month, but uh, of course, it was after our last month's meeting so congratulations to them yay yes yes congratulations and, um, yeah so we have uh, several of you that are very close either to a milestone or to recertification so um yeah look at your hours and check to see what you need we're getting close to the end of the year it'd be great to have some more recertifications all right thank you all right and Joseph, I know you've been busy with other things. Do you have anything to report about the website or anything, any numbers from Facebook? We know what went on tonight with 
Basically. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we had our, our the best presentation ever tonight, and uh, lots of people watched it. And that's about all I can think of. I'm just too wiped out. <laughs> all these technical <laughs> difficulties was not fun today. That's, well, we appreciate you so much. Thank you. And um, Anita, I know you already mentioned something about uh, the couple of articles, and I know you've. I, I'm always entertained by your articles and blogs. Thank you so much. You have oh, thank you. And, and that's what I want to do is entertain, uh, because I think if it's fun to read, people should uh, remember th remember things, but mm -hmm. they might not. Uh, I do want to mention that um, I wrote the the third Saturday story in the McAllen Monitor, and it's also I posted it on a couple of Facebook pages and uh sent sent it around to the listserv so you you all know what that's about and the the latest blog was clear back october 1st on owl be watching you about the great horned owl and um i have i still have two great horned owls and they they talk they talk to me when i go out in the wee hours of the morning to look at my moss sheet and the other morning they were really, really deep voiced and, and closer than I kind of like for them to be. So I kind of scurried back into the house, but it's, it's fun having them around. I do want to mention that the native plant project is having a meeting the 25th of October in West Laco. And I don't know what it's about, but November 15th, the third Tuesday, uh, I'll be the guest speaker for the native plant project. Cool. So that's, and, and those are, they're doing, and they're doing in in house and also, uh, I think zoom. So you don't have any excuse not to, to watch my latest. Be sure, be sure and give that information to Susan about the time and, and everything. And if there's a link, if okay. you do want to zoom or the location, so we can. We'll we'll get that included, or, or I'll include it in um, advanced training stuff. Okay. Um, also, um, while I think about it, while it's on my mind, Jennifer is going to be speaking. Jennifer, don't you have a talk later this week, Wednesday night? It's it's on the twenty sixth, so it's next. Twenty sixth next next week. Okay. Should probably practice my presentation. <laughs> I will be uh, presenting. Uh, if you were here for my dark skies presentation um, in the spring, I will be doing the same presentation at the South Texas Ecotourism Center um, in Laguna Vista. So that one will be in person, and I th think it's at six or six thirty. Um, not this week, but next Wednesday. Okay. You know, Anita, I love your articles about birds and the owls. I liked a lot. I know a lot about birds, but you always put something in there that teaches me about b different bird species that I didn't know. So I enjoy them a lot. So thank you. Oh, All right. right. Thank you. That's, that's an amazing uh, compliment when I can teach the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> What what, what would uh, your topic be uh, with the native plant project? Well, I can't think up a better one, and and so it's um, it, it, I always have to have a working title so I, I know what to open on my my uh, computer. So anyway, my working title is "Don't kill it until you know what it is." <laughs> Oh, good. I got a laugh. All right. So I might keep that. I really, I can't think of anything else. It's sort of a spinoff of our, uh, our uh, popular plants in the cracks of your sidewalk blog from, from July. It's sort of a spinoff of, of that. And basic, basically, it is, um, it's about plants that come up that you don't really want. But um, what I'm trying to show is how wildlife might want those, even though you don't. That's that's the crux of it. I think it's a good title. Keep it. Oh, yes. all right. Thanks. <laughs> all right. Very good. So I know Kathy Tong was having trouble getting on. 
And I don't know if she wound up on the phone is still here or not. Hi. We yes. finally did. We got in finally on Pierre's <laughs> machine. <laughs> All right. Very good. Thanks so much. I'm glad you made it. Do you have any announcements you'd like to make? Well, we are on the final days before the big Texas annual meeting takes place up in Houston. Um, for those who want to attend virtually and attend at least 13 AT possibilities plus the general sessions, they're allowing you to sign up all the way up until the 23rd. So you can even get the last day in for $125. So that's the price. But they have sessions all day, Friday and Saturday this coming week. All right. And um, if you do wind up signing up for that, uh, to be able to post those AT hours, uh, you need to be sure and let Ronnie know so he can add that opportunity to you. Oh, and one thing to add is that the chapter did vote that we would reimburse folks who would like to attend that. And Donna, you can tell them more to our active dues paying members. Uh, I don't remember all the details. Is Gail here? She's our treasurer. I think it was going to be $50 reimbursement. I don't have my notes right in front of me. Yes, yeah, that's here. right. That's right. It'll be very similar to last year, what we did last year. Um, after the meeting is completed and you post, they post their hours, then we will uh, send a check at that point. All right. And while I'm thinking about towards the end of the year, I wanted to put down, we're working on, and I'll mention it again later, we're working on chapter bylaws and chapter operating handbook. The bylaws have been approved by the state and one of our advisors and um, by the board pending our other advisor's approval. And I won't say his name, but I know he was on here tonight and the other one isn't. So he probably gets the <laughs> hint of who it is that needs to, and I'll follow up with him. Uh, so, um, yes, we have that coming up. And in addition to the uh, elections that are coming up in November, uh, general meeting, we want to, um, hopefully get approval from the membership for the chapter operating handbook and the bylaws, which we didn't have a lot of flexibility this year. It's here, this what has to be in there and you cannot change anything except this and this almost throughout both documents. So it's pretty, not, it's not very flexible, but we hope you all will, we're gonna get those out to you. We're required to have them out 15 days before voting day. So it'll be, um, even before our board meeting in November that we have to get those out to you. So watch for those. Um, as usual, we um, made a note about advanced training. We always have our TMM Tuesdays that can be watched for AT live and recorded. And one of those will, they are doing a recording. Um, now the last TMM Tuesday was in, it was the different projects presented by the different chapters and the judges were there and they were uh, judging them and the announcements of the awards for those um, uh, chapter projects will be uh, as part of the annual meeting. But any of the other recordings uh, that you want to watch can be watched uh, for AT. And um, I don't know if Ann wants to speak about the uh, birding festival. There'll be speakers there and um, uh, yeah, it, it'll be a, 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 a nice November event. 9th, November 9th to the 13th and they have a vendor show in the big hall and that's open to the public every day at noon uh, starting, I think it opens Thursday. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday it's noon on and it's all kinds of optics and anything about nature from earrings to pottery, you name it. It's fun to go through and it's huge. It's very big. Um, and that's free to the public open at noon, starting on Thursday of that week, November 9th through the 13th. Um, right. You can sign up for trips. If you go online to the um, 
Rio Grande Valley Birding Festival. You can look at the trips and see what's still available. Some trips are still open. And then there's some free things you can go to. So I'm guiding at San Benito Wetlands. So that's free. They're allowing people to come up there to bird in the ponds. Um, water birds. I mean, Jim took this beautiful picture of a wood stork the other day flying over um, the pond. So there's great birds. And if you're just beginning, um, I think they're even going to have binoculars out there. So go on the birding festival site and you can learn all about those things. Right, and you can get advanced training, but also um, down below in the next section, um, they have uh, opportunities for volunteering and a website to go to volunteer. Oh yes, yeah. I need some. I need some more workers. Yeah, I lost a few due to surgery, and a husband and a wife that were working for me. And so, if you're interested in volunteering, yeah. there's opportunities there. It could be yeah. pretty flexible. You can call me for more information or go on the website and you can register as a volunteer and you need to register as a volunteer because when you go in, um, there's a computer and you put your name in as a volunteer and it spits out your name tag. So we give you a lanyard and you put your name tag in and then you're official. That's why people have to go on on the site. Um, on to, the, register. to register. So is that like one of those spitting spiders? <laughs> Not near as hey, cool. I'll look on the back side of that computer and see if there's one there. Yeah, I do have a question right. for you, Anne. When yes. when is your when are you guiding that tour at the San Benito Wetlands? I'm I'm doing it um, Sunday morning, uh, eight to ten. Eight in the morning. Yes, the birds. Right. No the birds, birds get, get up early. early. Where early birds get the worm, yeah, you got to get up early. Hey, we get up at five o'clock sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or you can just go out for spiders and stay up late. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Go for the yeah. spiders and stay yeah. up all night. For the, the first birds year, the, the first year they asked me to be a guide, so I'm not just working the festival. I'm going to be guiding, and I'll get an official guide's hat and badge. But that's one of the. I'm doing a Benson um, guided tour also. And two others, but they haven't told me yet. So they're going to be big surprises, I guess, when I get there. Well, don't overdo it. Oh, I know. Ian I'm always still, does. Oh, uh, maybe I'll need a well, wheelchair. I don't know. <laughs> I'm well, y'all just take, take I'm care still out got there. the pain from the shingles on the left side. So almost all gone, but still. So hopefully it'll be gone by the festival. She's feeling better. She's been giving me grief all yeah, day. Yeah, I'm giving them the business. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you for that update, Ann. We appreciate it. I think uh, the other things we've already been mentioning, the pollinator bio blitz is ongoing till the 23rd. The Ilano Grande Spider Mania, October 22nd. Um, and I do have Becky Reyes. I think that's just the general number for Estero over there. If you let them know you want to volunteer, uh, we talked about the birding festival. Um, something else that starts November 1st is Project Feeder Watch. And I've done that several years. It's something you can do from home. Or if you have a nearby um, place where people feed birds that you want to observe, you can do it that way. And I have that link for that there. Uh, is there any other business? I know we're getting ready to go into our next board meeting is November 7th. Our general meeting is November 21st. And Elizabeth, are you still there? You want to talk about what Sylvia is going to be discussing? I'm not sure what her um, actual working title is, but she will be talking about native plants and, uh, and a part of her focus will be about uh, drought resistant things, especially since the, you know, um, it's getting hotter and drier generally in the Rio Grande Valley and water is in short, shorter supply with uh, population growth and all. So she'll be talking about plants, but kind of with those things in mind, with those challenges now in the future in mind. Okay. Well, thanks for that update. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the November 21st will be the last general meeting for the um, year. Uh, Sylvia will be our speaker. 
We're going to hold election of officers, and with the nominating committee headed by Robert Hernandez is um, uh, still looking for people to fill a couple of positions. Uh, so if you are interested in helping out, please contact him. Uh, we will be chat also voting on the chapter bylaws and chapter operating handbook, which will take effect um, uh, January 1st. And a lot of that is, um, yeah, a lot of that is um, taking effect January 2023. And then we do have a change for instead of a end of year social, several people were talking about how busy they were going to be and other things that were uh, conflicting. So we have changed it to a beginning of the year social. It's still going to be at Oleander Acres, but uh, it's no longer in December. It'll be January 7th, and we will send out some more details. And um, uh, yeah, so um, talk to Robert. I'm just looking at the chat to be sure I haven't missed anybody's uh, note to remind me to do one thing or another. Thank you very much, everyone. Like I say, this is a good team. They're not going to let us uh, fall down on the ball, drop the ball in any way. Uh, does anybody else have any other announcements that I have forgotten about or that uh, I didn't know about yet? Hopefully at the um, uh, beginning of the year social, there will also, weather will cooperate so there can be some garden tours, which would be a T at that point, but um, that's right. You know, God willing, and the you know, weather cooperates. <laughs> One other thing, we plan to have a fantastic silent auction because we've been collecting items for the last couple of years, and there's some amazing things in there. That's right. So watch for some more details. Yeah. If anybody has something they'd like to donate. Um, nature related, a book, a bird statue, a spider stat picture, <laughs> a spider picture, or something. You just bring it to that that meeting. You bring it to our holiday or whatever you want to call it party, and right. we'll add it to the right. silent auction. It's kicking off the year the right way, or starting it the right way with a big celebration. So, okay, and somebody was asking. Um, uh, what's the deadline for posting their volunteer hours for this year? Um, usually, the, per the state guidelines, you have 45 days from the time you did the tr the volunteer work. You have to post it within 45 days. Um, and at the and I think at the beginning year they may shorten that a little bit, but we'll we'll double check with Ronnie, or it may be in these operating handbooks, and I just don't remember because I've been getting cross-eyed reading some of that stuff. But uh, we will be sure y'all know uh, you need to be keeping up with those hours every month, whether it's uh, training or volunteer hours, because um, we have to get special permission from the state if it's over the 45 days. And we like you to get in earlier because we have to forward it to them within those 45 days. So anything else? All right, I like the comment, go for the spiders, stay for the birds. You know, that, that pretty well sums us up as master naturalists, right? <laughs> All right, with that, it is just right at eight o'clock. Um, so an hour for the program and a half hour, 0. 0.50 for the business meeting. And thank you everyone for your patience um, in, in, in getting this all taken care of with the um, technical difficulties. Oh, oh, I turned you back off. All right. Yeah. And did you have something else to say? You're not muted <laughs> anymore, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing. <laughs> and he goes, you're all yeah, where you're at, you're but it's right in where I'm at. You can tell she's feeling better or getting all oh, That's just what I was going to say. You look like you're feeling better, and we're all very happy for yeah. that. Just, just, you look just, like your normal, feisty, wonderful self. Yeah. Dang. So it's <laughs> ending, the meeting's I ending on a good note. I I'm saw you with a giant good spider, to see Wendy. Everybody. I miss you all. <laughs> Almost. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. All right, everybody. Be well.
Okay. Thank y'all, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. What's left of it?